and I said to myself, <clears throat> what field am I entering? I'm entering criminal justice, and it's a field that have defined expectations where this person is a criminal, this person is an offender, and it's a system where things will equal themselves out and, and everybody will be treated fairly and it's going to work just like it does on TV. And that's what I thought going into the criminal justice system. Um, we're laughing already. <laughs> yeah, it's true. You learn these things over time. So I, so I graduated from college. I came home and I was taking, home being Binghamton, and I was taking some police officer exams. And in the meantime, a position came up for a youth division aide at a maximum secure juvenile facility, which is in uh, Brooktondale, which for those of you familiar with the area is near Ithaca. And it's where juveniles are sent after they're convicted of crimes and they're held until they reach their 18th birthday. At that time, if they are a problem resident, they're sent to the Department of Corrections to finish out their sentence. If they are a good inmate or somebody who is worth keeping for a little bit, um, the state will hold on to them until they reach 21, then they're sent to the Department of Corrections. Um, I applied for the job thinking I would stay there for a little bit of time and continue taking police exams, <clears throat> and I was doing so. I got the job in 1996 and I started working right away after some training and I was put on a unit that Eric had just been put on after coming from court. Um, and that's where I first met Eric Campbell. So altogether I had my non-criminal life up to this point and it's not as though I didn't do anything wrong. I hadn't been arrested or, or made major mistakes. I had my college education, and I had about five weeks of training at the New York State Division for Youth facility in, uh, I believe it's in Red Hook now, where they send you and they teach you how to interact with youths who are confrontational, and they teach you how to handle uh, confrontational situations, and they work through some of the problems that you're going to face as a YDA, and, and that's what I was. So I had all of that under my belt, going into a new hostile environment. And that's when I met Eric Campbell, who had just come from being sentenced as a juvenile. And I'll let him uh, introduce himself. As everyone knows, Eric Campbell. At the age of 15, I was sentenced to seven years of life, seven years of murder. Before him, I had a typical life. I grew up in New York, two-parent household. Not the average idea of someone who can place in a situation like that. And one day everything changed. Uh, a friend of mine's name was Randall Flores. He came to me with a bright idea. He said, let's rob somebody. Now, when I tell the story, everybody's like, from the get, why did I go along with it? In the environment that I lived, I grew up out of the crack era. Um, crime was prevalent. It was big at the time. And we grew up in an environment where we always argued who was the toughest, or my block is the toughest. And being in that such environment, kind of desensitized to a lot of things. So at that very moment when he said it, in my gut I knew initially it was wrong. But my first error was not seeing it. And I let the day progress. At that moment in my life, I had so much things going on. I was going to school, I had a basketball scholarship to uh, St. John's, at and I had a lot of things going on. Um, but a tragedy happened when my mother passed away. And I kind of secluded myself. I didn't know how to say I was hurt, I didn't know how to say I was sad. So what I did in turn was place myself in environments where a lot of things could take place like such. And what happened was he left. And again he came back and he says, I got a gun. And again when I tell the story, everyone says, he said, come, why would you be there? I mean, growing up, I've sold him shop, sold him personally. I mean, we went to the park and we sold him in the car. So it wasn't something that was like, wow. But again, my second error was in my gut. I initially knew it was wrong. And I still didn't say it. As the night progressed, we walked around, we walked around, and he's like, you know what? I'm going to rob the beauty salon on the corner. And instead of saying, no, I'm not with it, I'm like, no, 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 no. It's a two way street. People will see us. And he agreed with it. And again, instead of going to me with my gut, I'm trying everything else in the world to get against, or go against what I want to go and 
About an hour passed and we bumped into a guy named Kevin Francis. Um, he was an old guy. He was one of the guys that we competed in with in basketball. And he speaks to my co-defendant on the side. And this is when the night actually progressed to the crowd. As we walk towards the corner, I guess with all my excuses, uh, my co-defendant says, you know what? I'm not alone in the store real quick. Um, just wait outside. He goes in the store and I'm waiting. See where I'm going anyway. As soon as I push the door, the first thing I hear is a person laying down. I look over, there's a gun at the guy at the catch and still there's another guy laying in the place, surviving the I'm stuck. I say, Atlanta, what you doing? He says, don't see my name. In that second, the guy grabs the gun. There's a tussle. He looks over me and he says, help me. And I really don't know what to do. But I take one step over this guy. And then boom, just like that chaos. Everything goes black, I see nothing. I hear two shots. When I open my eyes, I see a guy with a bat. Now, the police reports, it's known that he hit me in the head with a bat. At that moment, I didn't feel no bat. It just went black. We ran out of the store. I went home, bleeding, gushing. And he's like, I think I killed him. And I'm like, yo, what happened? And it was so fast. It was like being in a room and someone shook it up. Whatever you land, you land. It was surreal. It was unreal. I couldn't believe how quickly the events changed. The next day, I go to school, I'm feeling completely awkward. Not even myself. I walk past somebody, I'm like, they must know. Something deep down in me kept saying, I didn't shoot. I'm innocent. I didn't, I didn't do it. He did it. So I should be feeling like, all right, all right. Well, then once time, I had friends in Orlando, Florida, so I was arrested. And that's when I felt the ease that, okay, they got him, the story's done, everything's cool. A week later, I was arrested. It happened when I was in school, I went to transit technique, so uh, inside of school, we had trains where they actually let you work. I was in the workshop working on the train, the train, and I had a uh, camera. The truck is looking at me like, looking at the officer, like, tell, because I don't want to do that. I'm looking at him like, he's not saying anything. He finally points. The officer draws a gun in class, which wasn't the right thing to do, but I was going out of the court quickly. And I threw my woman at the time, I got on the floor, and she's in my hand, and she's like, you know, fucking down, I'm going down, you know, baby, you're killing me, and I'm like, what the hell's going on? And the moment I got out that classroom, everything changed. These guys in suits, don't worry about it, man. We got to shoot him. This guy bring me out. Question. Bad, you know, it's not an issue. Why? It wasn't me. They took me down to the precinct. They had waited to me that I landed on the floor. They just confessed to the crime. We just needed the genite of the events. And then they put this paperwork in front of me. And I'm like, well, this and this really didn't happen. Yeah, he did shoot the guy, but this part, don't worry about that. He already confessed, you have nothing for him. This sign I saw, he go to Brooklyn's and here before I ever pick you up. That's so what I need to hear. Here's the pen. Hands to me, put my John hand cop immediately. I never saw the streets until I was 28 years old again. That night I went to Central Brooklyn, not knowing what was going to take place. Get the overall, take the pictures, put me from one cell to another cell, they put me in the wrong cell. When I was 15 years old, they put me in the adult cell so they found out. Which kind of wasn't a bad thing because when they found out I was in juvenile, they put me in the cell by myself. Yeah, but there was a lot of time, like, a lot of confusion going on. Moving around, people kind of get occupied with like, things around me. So I spent that night awake, wondering when they're going to come get me. So morning, probably about nine ish. When they say, Oh, Campbell, they cuff me in my head. Maybe this is procedure. And they take me into the courtroom. And it's kind of like this, you know. Put my back face in I look back and I see all these people going on. I'm trying to look for family members. And I had the judge say, You know, basically, this is how the courtroom sounds at the time. Blah, 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 blah. Remand. I've never heard that word before. I'm thinking remand. 
reads like before, man. man. Maybe I'm going back home. Hey, put me in the saddle. Like, okay, maybe this is done there. Maybe someone will come pick me up. I know. It's far from me. A juvenile tense or something came together. And this was the first time I heard the word hardware. Do we got the right hardware, fam? It's a step up. And then we brought another gentleman in, and he cuffed him his hand, hand and feet together. Oh, maybe he's gone too. We, we, we brought him out together. And you know, he took me downstairs to the bus. I was a lot of people going on the day. Put us on the bus, and he called us, and I'm like, well, I know Brooklyn. We, we're leaving Brooklyn, which is far from space in the Bronx. And when I got to this big place, it looked like a huge, it, I call it like a huge dumpster cash. It was just MG with barbed wire. They wrote me in and they were saying, well, we gotta find this housing. And that's when I realized that this is not gonna be a go home situation. They placed me on Broadway, which is the orientation. The procedure is really good. They shook me down, put this thing stuff in the air. And go do this, and they give you these bins. You gotta pick the dirty drawers, because they weren't great. Dirty drawers, old shoes with no laces, pants that don't fit, baggy shirts. Put you on the house. And there's no instruction manual. You know, there's no guy, no one saying, well, this is what you gotta do, this is the time, this is it. It's kind of like it's just throwing you alone. I was a Sparfield for the whole year, um, fighting the kids. Sparfield. Um, the Blue Mountain Assembly was kind of like, as they called it, it was the introduction to gladiators. Outside of fighting your kids and being away from your family, there's a lot of things in that environment that you have to deal with. And I give you short examples. The officers there are supposed to do a head count. And um, the head count is usually through every doorway. The first person starts on one, two, three, four, the last minute, 24 on the count. That way, you know, you don't escape. Being a new guy, you have you know, clue with this. So you ain't guys counting it, you just walk in the door. Officer automatically says, square up. And you see a circle form around you. And he's like, who's the oldest guy in the house? And I fight. You're not messing up my count on this block. And then fight. And you really don't get it, like, it's like, whoa, what happened? You're fighting. And if you don't fight, then you're gonna fight the next one that's got in the house. These are some of the circumstances you face in Sparkle and Junior Officer. So I went through a year of that, and you kind of learn quickly. After your first fight, you're like, okay, I'm paying attention to that. Um, you know, you don't sit close to the TV, you see a lot of people cut for that. You know, even sitting in certain seats, you can't even sit at. But the most confusing part of the whole process was the call. They didn't really understand it. And it's not really explained. And what I show with a lot of those students, I can sit and sit and ask them to never take anything on the assumption dealing with a client. Explain it again. Because if a person does not really know, they don't really know the questions to ask. And that was in my case. My lawyer, Steve Stone, was a friend of the family. So I trusted him. And I remember asking what's going to happen. And he used this word that kind of gave me a comfort zone. The professional. So I was there. I, I don't know what's going on in court. I went to court for a year, like I mentioned, oblivious to what was actually going on. It came up to around the time when they were picking the jury. And the jury selection was very difficult. We uh, kept people telling me stories, they asked a few questions, and you know, I heard people say, hey, you know, I'm gay, he's going to get guilty in the he's going to say guilty. And then we have to pick among those. And I'm saying to my I want that person. He's like, no, pick that person. I'm like, that person said they're really hard on crime. I really didn't get the, the math of the whole situation. Within three days of that, we started a trial. And this is where the misconceptions of the law got into my head. They offered me seven to life. Now, seven life. At the time, I mean, seven alone at 15 was like I was like, oh, I can't do seven. I mean, I didn't get ready, and that felt like felt. My lawyer says to me, well, you have a year in. 
The new one is a juvenile. You can transfer to an adult facility and do one more, come home and go to two years. That's not even too long. Is that because if you go to trial, chances are it's not going to be So I remember looking at my father in the courtroom and I was trying to talk to him. And they said, well, I'm, I'm going to get a quick visit for you. And I asked my father, what should I do? And he says, well, this is one decision that you have to make. I can tell you to take it. And you think you could have by five. I would take a fight and blow and you really want to take it. He said, This is my situation that I'll support you whatever you do. I tell you, my brother, he's like, You dumb motherfucker. You better take it. He said, You want to do 15 years in prison that you didn't do on the street? And he made me think, That's too many years. I got my lawyer, so I'll take it. I'll take it. And as soon as I said I take it, I want to be like, no, I'm not taking it back. I take it, I take it back. It's kind of hard making a decision. I'm really stuck with it. About a month later, I was sentenced. You know, the sentencing was very crucial because now I'm preparing myself to be away for two years. I'm going to call you, kind of sick with the idea that I have that chance. So now I know for sure that I'm going to be away for two more years. I get sent to a point sensitive where but when I get to McCormick Center, they do a quick interview and they kind of update you on the status of the situation. So she's reading over you know, my name, my crime, taking my murder, my charge. And she says something that throws a loop. She said, Oh, you were sentenced to life. I'm like, No, 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 no. I got seven, but I go in two years. She said, No, no, no. Your back number is your sentence. You're sentenced to life with the possibility for seven. I'm like, no, 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 I have a good time. She's like, life is a good time. So even I was sentenced, I didn't even know the ramifications of my sentence or stipulations. I had to do seven years before I actually went to my first goal, which was another crucial blow in my incarceration. It was another confusing reality hit. It was like being slapped when you sleep hit me hard. And then that's when it started the transition into a corner center meeting there. And that's where, where I had been working um, for a couple of months when, when Eric was finally, actually I believe you were there before me, I came after him, I was at training when he first came. And I started on a different unit, I was on a unit, and I had a difficult time understanding the inmates. Most of these were minority residents from New York City, shipped upstate just for the purpose of being housed. And I had a really hard time understanding, A, the language, and, and we still laugh about it today. Um, B, understanding what was going on, understanding the norms and the cultures that I had not grown up in, that I didn't get. <clears throat> and it took me a while because I was in their population. I was in their environment because despite being upstate, the residents of the unit could make it like their own little house, with their own little facility. And so being the non-minority, I was completely in the minority. And so what I did was I learned how to adjust how I addressed kids, how I looked at situations, and I began to look at things from a completely different perspective. <clears throat> um, the training that I went to gave me a little bit of an understanding of dealing with residents. But when it came down to actually being the one to take a kid, to put him into handcuffs, um, he, they were kids, but they frequently acted like violent adults. Um, put him in handcuffs, restrain him, address the situation, and then have the, the person return to your unit again. In your care requires a lot of patience, and it requires a lot of putting aside your anger feelings and dealing with what's right and wrong. And that's what I would do a lot of, <clears throat> especially on A unit. Um, there were frequent violent situations. Very few residents took serving a life sentence like Eric did. Most of them said, well, you know, F this, I'm serving five to life. So while I'm at this juvenile facility, I'm going to do whatever I can to disrupt and create problems and fight staff and be violent. Um, in fact, Eric was the only resident that I've ever come across 
in the criminal justice field that didn't become aggressive, didn't give up, didn't cash in his time and just say, you know what, I, I'm done, I'm going to do the best I can, I'm going to be a criminal in jail. <clears throat> so a unit was tough for me as a transition. Um, there were a lot of times when I questioned my own integrity, whether or not <clears throat> it would be easier for me to just let these things go, um, not follow the rules the way I'm supposed to as a staff, because if I've got 13 juveniles and they all want to do something that I know is wrong and there's no supervisor there to see me do it, I have to make the decision. Do I stand my ground and do what I know to be right or do I just allow it to happen because they're not going to turn me in because I'm letting them get away with something. And so frequently those situations, especially when you're paired up with another, paired up with another staff member, are difficult to deal with. And most of you want to head into the criminal justice field or in any field that you're going into. You will have times when you make ethical decisions about what is right and what isn't. You'll have times when you know the rules, but you have an easy opportunity to, to sidestep. In that situation, sidestepping the rules can be very dangerous. In police situations, they can be dangerous. Uh, so there was the majority of my initial conflict. Um, a supervisor noticed that I was having a hard time and sent me over to a different unit, to B unit. And that's where Eric had been. <clears throat> right away, after meeting Eric, I began to see that he was, in my eyes, different than other residents that I've met. Um, he had an understanding, A, of the world around him, but B, of his situation. Um, I, they paired us up as a mentor. They took a staff member and allowed him to mentor a resident. And, and he was chosen as my mentee. And I, and I think our relationship became solid there because you have a chance to go one-on-one -on -one and to talk to somebody. Um, in the craziness of trying to run a unit with 13 residents, you don't have the time to talk to people. You don't have the time. You're more worried about safety and security. <clears throat> when you actually have time to sit down and talk to somebody, you get to gain an understanding of where they are of where they came from, um, of the things that brought them up to today. And actually, we talked very little about the crime. And I did that on purpose as a person who worked in a facility. All of the residence folders were up front if you really wanted to go look at them and you would see the crime. I never did that. And in fact, 10 years later, I had to ask Eric about the crime when we started doing this. Um, because I knew very little about it. I knew what he was convicted of, but I knew very little details about the crime, and that was done on purpose because I felt like I would bring that down and treat each resident with the knowledge that I had. Maybe I would treat them differently, and I know that it benefited me. And, and the way I know that is because reading about Eric's crime on paper, you might say to yourself, this kid, you know, he did this, this, and that. He's as guilty, he deserves it, and that's it. But there are times when people plead to things with some limited knowledge and end up facing a sentence that will haunt them and that will weigh on them. So I knew very little of his crime. I knew little of the other residents' crimes. But I began to see in Eric things that made me feel like I began to question some of the reasons why I got into the field. I said to myself, well, if a person's convicted and they're serving their sentence, how do you possibly have lingering doubts as to whether or not the sentence was fair? And I'm speaking of myself. I began to question whether or not this person needs to have a life sentence. Um, and that's not up to me to change, but it began my road down thinking of whether or not the sentences that people receive are equal to the crimes they commit. And I think that's important as you go on in your fields. You don't always have the ability to change the things that are written into law. If you get convicted of a robbery, you're going to get this sentence. If you get convicted of a kidnapping, you're going to get this sentence. And those are statute and they're criminal procedure law. But what you do have the ability to control is reading other people, jumping to conclusions, assuming that what you read on paper is exactly how a person is. And I still do it. I am a probation officer. I still do it to this day, and, and I'm conscious of it. 
I'll get a new file on my desk as a new probation case that's come from court, and I say, oh, you know, I know exactly how this is going to go. And I look at the rap sheet, I look at the criminal history, and I look at the report, and I say, yeah, this is going to go this way. And then I meet the person, and, I, and it's completely wrong, and I had it all wrong, not all the time, luckily. You have to be aware of these things. You have to be aware that people do change, that things on paper are not always how they are. So back to my life on McCormick on B unit, Eric and I began our mentoring sessions and his friend Roy would sit in sometimes because Roy looked up to Eric. And um, we would began to work on the things and I said, you know, this young man has a lot of potential. He understands what's going on, he understands the situation, and he seems to bring a lot to the table. Um, that being said, I left the McCormick Center in 1999 because there was a better job offer, but frankly because I was completely burnt out of that setting. Um, while Eric was helpful and a good resident to work with, there were 50 others that were not. And, and it is a violent situation, and it is a, a tense situation, and it wears on you as a staff person. Um, so in 1999, I took a job as a probation officer, which allowed me to see things greater and see a, have a wide aspect of the system. And I began to reflect on my time in McCormick and say, wow, you know, this is what I was thinking. I was looking at all these things, and I'm looking more into the system, and I'm beginning to see that you know it's tough to look at cases and pigeon them, pigeonhole them into life sentences. And that's really the gist of what got me reaching out to Eric and talking uh, to this situation. So I'll let him take over from here because back in hindsight, I'm gone from McCormick now, and, but Eric is still there. When I arrived at McCormick Center, there was more of a structured environment than Swafford, which was a tough transition. But to give you a brief understanding of the circumstances and the placement, we have 13 residents my housing unit was predominantly lifers, so like I said, there was a lot of frustration. We were dealing with puberty, life sentences being away from family members, one TV that only has four channels, two toilets, two showers, and nothing. So it was an easy, conflict environment. Between fighting for chairs, being rebellious, rebellious with lockdowns, not one lockdown, fighting with staff, arguing. These were things that were common. A card game couldn't go without fun. So on top of dealing with the stressful thoughts of being born to be, parents to be, we have to deal with that. I was in McCormick Center from age 16 to 21. Uh, he said they had the mentoring sessions, which were kind of useful. They kind of broke the barriers, because at the same time, as he was sick with a lot of his ideas, we were too. Being an inmate, or wasn't at the time, he's on the outside. So to break those barriers with the counseling sessions, actually let both of us grow individually and let us actually expose who we are outside of his uniform in our action. McCormick had a lot of different programs, victim awareness, while there I tried to soak up everything I possibly could. Keep busy. Became a teacher's aide, reading, um, the cooking, the mess hall, did multiple different things while there. It was very limited, um, which for a juvenile facility, with youthful, with youth period, they're in a stage of uh, adapting, learning who they are, and adjusting. We weren't allowed to see the moves. We were reading materials, we were scanning, we weren't really allowed to read a lot of things, newspaper or contraband. We were really restricted, which also caused a big rebellious Everything was seen as a gang member or gang activity, like in terms of a lot of the language. And it was a lot of front office sending back then. The way Tali Shoemakers is a gang member, the way they talk. So a lot of things were reflected wrong that caused a big communication barrier, which a lot of us didn't know how to explain ourselves, but we did lash out. Because I was this when I was 21. When you turn 21, they send you to which is DFC, part of the corrections. Go on time in DFY, you figure out, like, I guess I got how to bid. Then, so I'll be good when I transfer over. When we transfer me over, they send me down more, which is clinic correction facility. 
and that was my first place of facility. I was 21 years old. Right? I'm a midget now, so you can imagine me at 21 walking into a place um, fresh out of a juvenile facility. And despite my age, the juvenile facility kind of limits you in which your activities and growth, period. So I still was about 17, 18 at 21 because of my environment. Within my first two days of being in uh, Clinton Collection City, I've sat. Uh, I went to the uh, yard um, and told everybody, get off the block, go to wreck. Okay, I went to wreck and I didn't know that everybody had their own place in the yard. And I go there and I stand in one little spot, there's lines. My guy comes to me and says, yo, chief, you can't really be there right now. I was in the car. I go, he was cool about it. I went to another one and the guy's like, yo, we're going to cook a little bit. So you got to go. I said, you know what, I'm going to wait till everybody get here. And whichever one is empty, I'm going to go. I wait, mm -hmm. I see one spot empty. I go. And a guy who later I find out his name is Speedy, he comes to me and he says, I paid. If you can't stand it. And here's why you did with everything competition. You got to take a stand. So I said, you know, maybe this is one of those moments. I said, Pops, I ain't going. I ain't going. I went there, I went there, I went there, I ain't going over. He said, You crazy? He spun for me probably 10 steps away from me. He stabs the gentleman in his life and spins off. Immediately, I'm like, Okay, I'm new. I just told Playboy that I'm not going. He stabbed the guy he was just talking to. Big girl alarm goes on. Now, I see everybody immediately drop. It was just like clockwork. As soon as it went off, everybody dropped down. Head in the ground. I'm not doing that. You just stabbed somebody. I just told you I'm not moving. Bro, one shot. God said, the next one's in you. My face was in that ground. <laughs> we were laying there possibly, I was going to you know, about 10 hours. The sergeant came and he was like, Somebody stabbed somebody on my shift. I can't go home till the paperwork's done. I love overtime, so we're gonna be here. We made that. Well, coughed, urinated, shift as he walked by and kicked you. We immediately beat down. Clubs in your head, beat down, and escorted out the yard. No one told me. He was like, hey, I wouldn't talk, so he was called me White Stone. You get nicknames like that. So hey, White Stone, man, he was messing with speed, man. What you gonna have to do, right? I said, wow, I don't know why. I'm trying to read the situation. I'm not going to the yard. I made sure the program I get on the block porter, I can sweep the tear. So one day the officer says, hey, man, you never free the block, man. Go out and get some air. He's like, well, you're going to get kicked out of reception room anyway, so you're going to have to go to the yard. Uh, you know what I see? He was real cool to you. Hey, you crazy guy. You know, he was real, real sarcastic. He said, they want me to your house. He said, we're going to switch, but they're going to move me to your house. Next day, I'm going to tell you, the news was on. It's empty. I said, you know what? I know you don't sit in the first row when you're a guy on the block. He's usually in the boat, the guy that's been there. Yeah. So I sat in the room behind him, and the gentleman comes. It's probably 20 seats. He says, you're in my seat. I said, I said, you know what? I'm not even going to be competition. I mean, he's got a scratch all the that. I said, you know what? I'm going to sit in the back. I'm going to I sat in the back. Nearly if I sat in the back. The team going was packed. They changed it. They changed the news. They watched the BT. They were scanning around. And it was count time. And now looking back, I see the whole, the whole lineup. But then I did They bum rush the door. Everybody's bum rushing the door. And as I go to get on line, I see stars. I'm like, did somebody punch me? 
And I live in my home. And there's a life in my home. It's stuck in there. It's so sad. And the point of the time, his name was Muhammad. He couldn't take off his shirt. He threw it on my shirt. Sure, it was my arm. And he says to me, just walk to your side. And I'm like, I'm sad. He was like, yeah, you were. He said, don't take it out. Stand in the center of your arm in the sink. I mean, this guy had mapped out. This wasn't something that was new, new for me. He said, just stick your arm in the So I get in the cell and I'm like, nah, I pull it out. I don't know why he said Blood everywhere. It's a count time. Officers are making their ground. I blood on the floors. I'm throwing my stuff. Find my hand in the sink. Put it back over. I'm off to the cell. He comes back to my cell. He's like, listen, is it back door? He's a song kid. So what? Trying to adjust with the program. Um, 
was a porn center. I had opportunities to friends from TC from college. While I was in uh, an okay, uh, vocational draft, drafted. So I said, no, I'm going to take all the programs I can. So I started taking up arm, nurses aid, arm you aid, and getting these specific certificates. So when I go to the program, I have something to show me. Time passed and I actually need up to operate. And I have like stacks of activities. I had so many programs that when I went to a facility, they started telling me, we're just gonna put you on the So we gotta let the mid guys get some. So when you go to your pro board, it's kinda it's kinda like a big room like this. The only difference is you have one desk and it's three commissioners and you sit about I'd say seven feet away. And you sit there with your fountain in front of them and they ask you questions like they're already doing. So you are Eric Kendall, yes. With a girl, yes. Sentence to seven years of life, brother, yes. Tell us what happened. Now, what I signed to originally is not what happened. So I had to prepare myself to actually say word for word what didn't happen. So I don't like a downplay when I take responsibility. So I had to prepare myself for that aspect. I had that down. I memorized everything. I told them what happened. I went into my spell, which was truthful, you know, about the lives that I kind of I still had a sense of innocence to myself. I wasn't the shooter. So I guess my first pro board didn't display too much um, sympathy. Um, because I was still under the idea that he did it. Everybody knows he did it. It's in my fat. What did you say he did The commissioner looked at me and said, listen, you're a young man. You'll be a young man when you get up. Do not let me see you back in these circumstances. Go in and be something. I had these in my actual minutes. Over with, I'm done, I'm done with this place forever. Great. Two days later, uh, they mail you your report. You know, they don't tell you that you get the denial or the uh, release. So I opened it up, you know, they told me I'm come back. I was taking 24 months. I was going to be here to my next room in two more years. All that kept echoing. Family's asking me, what did you do? You behaving yourself. Now, granted, I'm in an unnatural environment. It's hostile environment. So I find a lot of different things that take place there. But I'm not doing anything to add to it. I'm just surviving. And at that time, everything that ever took place wasn't my fault. So I had a clean record of disciplinary I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. That made the situation that was like the third smack while you sleep in reality. I had two minutes to do it. Within that time, frustration, riots took place. Uh, it was a big hostile uh, environment out to the time. Every day there was locked down for the riots. I was placed in a box. Think about riots, which is the reason why I was placed in a box. If you two gentlemen start fighting, Officers pull their pin, and it's assistance needed in this area. Location. When they come in, they do not care who they see first. It's attack. So everyone in the room, once there's a fight, is a fight. so once they come in the door, everybody's ready to fight. And that's what occurred. It's about 57 guys in the environment, which was the yard at the time. Once in a box for three months. Because when they came, they just started hitting you. They hit you and you part of the door. So I was in the box right after my pool, still in the place for my next one. The transition out of the box, being in the box for the first time, it's not like in the movies, it's big brick walls and mice room and drawers, which they do have mice room. But the cell is all steel. Um, that one hour wreck thing, your wreck is in your cell. They have a little cage that they open for you. You walk in the cage and it throws you in your cell. That's your wreck. Um, 
15 months of that, you don't really hear anybody. It's just been small violence. Kind of left with just your thoughts. And that's when my first taste of my crime and my responsibility hit me. I was thinking about my family. Saying to myself, two guys went to the wall. My father was in the team. Even though the guy who didn't shoot me, but I hold him responsible. And I was like, yes. And that was my taste of my reality. Like, wow, I did have responsibility from the get. I knew it wasn't right. I felt it. And I went against it. I'm just as wrong. That moment in the box gave me a whole different outlook of my me and my whole situation. So when it led me up to my second home, the problem with that one was I was so far in the facility called Franklin. Commissioners wouldn't even come. So they had us on TV. And it was a satellite, which made it difficult. It was that terrible kung fu and the moment I'm trying to reply, they are ready. Could you speak up? And it's like, this is killing me. Probably five minutes in, the comments is like, we'll give you a decision. I didn't get to speak. We didn't really know what that decision was. Let's hit the 24 months again. That changed everything again because I was moved once more. Now, when you first get into DOC, they kind of shoot you way up top. And as the years go by, they transfer you down to facilities. So they bring the newer guys up. They transfer you down. The problem with that is, a lot of times in uh, detention, you have all these conflicts. Everybody's just learning how to do their bed. And then you shift up. And then there comes a time when you're very, very guys. Some people are forgetful, some people are mature. But sometimes it's the same in prison. You have to think for the other guy. That means where you are in life, say for instance, where I was, I really got to really know how to be. My comfort level went down. I was really cool. I knew what I wanted to do to try to get out. A lot of guys were. So now I was there with the conflict of thinking for the guys. I know he wants to fight. So now I got to be in the problem. You don't want to say, no, I want to fight. But now that's a whole nother conflict. You have to be wise about it. So dealing with being here at the Pro Bowl, here I am in a facility with when we first started in 1995. It's in 2005 now, and I'm in a facility with 10 guys that we fought years ago. Some of them came to me and like, hey, five months ago, I'm trying to go Some guys are not scared of the I'm in the front. Let me see you in the next hall. It's on. Some guys didn't know where I was. I was like, listen, same room to him. It's cool. I don't have problems. That still was a conflict, because I don't know if he's over me for a joke or not. That went on and on, and I still try to involve myself with different programs and different things like that. And in this program book, which in my first two, I was trying to work on my parole package. And in my first parole package, I had letters like Darren Schmidt, who wrote letters to me. I have a few methods. But this one I said, you know, I want to have a street game plan that I can present to you. Because I can see my file. Trying to compete with my file is different. We have parole commissioners that go to a facility, see 300 guys, but I have to go to 20 facilities. How can you know, being sincere sound truth? They hear it all day. Oh, I'm in law school. I feel sorry for the guy. I feel sorry for the body. I want to change my life. I want to do it over. How do you do that? I say, you know what? I'm going to do this game plan that I'm tight. I have to show them that I have a support. So I have to show them that I have an idea of what I want to do. And again, on my third parole board, Darren Schmidt and many others wrote letters for me. So I'm going to show them that you know, I do have a support. And they do go to home. I had letters of employment. I had school saying that they were going to take me in there and help me. I had so much stuff going on. My family moved to Florida. And then my second parole board. That my home placement would be better. I'm trying not to go back to the place where the crime took place. Well, having a whole new start. So we thought that would be better, which it wasn't, because New York was saying, Well, oh, you went to Florida, we're not going to transfer you. You have to go to New York. So now my support base 
it's kind of scary. And now my family's in Florida, and I'm like, wow, where am I going to find a place in New York? I don't want to shelter. Which, ironically, my fourth grade teacher, Patricia Rose, who came in contact with me since fourth grade, doing my, doing my whole cultivation, said, what are you talking about? Where did God go? Where did we? So I was like, oh, my package is coming together perfectly. I have the job. I had a place to go, I had letters. I came into my third program. I'm like, this has to be it. I'm trying to charm you. You're trying to make sense out of the situations. Um, within that time, I had the most students and a professor named Laura Coleman from Rutgers University to cover my case. I was doing a lot of appeals for my role points, which get denied, but they go mm-hmm. after a while. The time, Cases being heard and going to the parole board anyway. But it gave me something to fight for. So she also was helping. She said, It's time, just in case. Let's get all the, the appeals and Article 78s ready now. Is that cool? But I kind of feel positive about this one. I went into the parole board and I said, It's time to speak. Let's speak. Let's speak more than I just yes, no, yes, no. Which I see in my minutes. Because when you read the minutes, it's like they didn't say anything. Being is kind of difficult to explain. I go in. The first commissioner, who my name is Garcia, was there for my first program. And I was like, yeah, she's going to get words out of me today. So she said, Eric Campbell, I was going to my school, yes. I was convicted for a terrible crime. You know, I heard a lot of lives, not only my life, my family's life. I changed lives forever. That's how you feel in your life. And you know how I went in and she let me speak? She said something that changed the whole thing. She said, compared to a life, do you think your freedom is worth it? How do you answer that? Yeah. Then I just kind of just downplay the life that it was. I say, no, then you keep me. I just, it froze. How do I answer that? I waited. She said, never mind, we'll get to the decision in the mail. Two days later, again, I was here for 24 months. By this time, I was getting a little frustrated, and I started to channel my anger and learning case law, going to the law library, digging deep into cases, trying to fight it that way, trying to occupy myself with the idea that I have hope that it doesn't look like the parole board is going to hold for me. Things like that, I'm going to have to do it actually myself. I went to the box again, um, which gave me some more time to gather myself. And that's when, again, another revelation took place. When that question came about. And I kept playing it over and over. How do you answer? How do you answer? And then I came to the conclusion that I'm not going to answer. But I'm going to explain myself around it. And I'm evaded. But place me in it where I can explain on both sides. I got to my full parole board. We were preparing mock parole board hearings, you know, I don't know at the time. She was trying to you know, get me down for questions like that, to how to answer them. And, you know, we did months of work and we got it down. The day was kind of walking in, you know. I had my papers in front of me, my files. I had my release plan. And I said, you know what? I put it down and I'm walking out. I was like, they're gonna hit me. They're gonna hit me, but I'm gonna say everything today that I want to say. Next one we go. Sat down, he was like, Eric Campbell? I was like, yes. He's like, well, we see that you, you know, you're a nurse's aide. I said, I don't want to talk about that. They looked up. This was the first time all three commissioners looked up. And he's like, excuse me? I don't want to talk about things like that. You know, you took many trainings and schooling to be a parole commissioner. I'm not asking you your predictions of why you did it. I want to talk about my name. And the one to the left who usually no one to the left speaks to. Uh, so I got a question. Why? And I was like, because you have my file in front of you. You've had my file for years in front of you. Let's talk about something that's not in the file. Commission says, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Let me just go over what I have to do. So I let them go over the seven of life, yes. Had me go through, yes. And tell us what happened. 
子，变子啊，产生一些变差的东西。那我们这边的马子是用马来西亚。And before that is finished, that stump question came. Would you change it? Would you change what you've done because of the album's loss? And immediately I would have said, yeah, I would change. I would go back to that day and I would say, it's all I have to do it. I said, no. Yeah, this kid's crazy. I said, no, I wouldn't change it. I said, yes, I'm not going to lose. Yes, I'm not going to hurt. Nothing. There's nothing that can compare to it. There's nothing I can do to make that better. But what I've learned, what I've learned to appreciate in my life, who I am today, the way I look at things, I'm confident in myself. I'm a better person now. I don't know if the trials and my journey that led me to this point, who I would have been But I know who I am today and who I am today. I'm sorry that life is lost. I'm sorry that even though my hand wasn't on the trip, by not going with I don't know what's wrong, I basically pulled the trip. Myself. I understand that. Can I change that? No. What I can do is change it. I then and now. And that was the first time I got like a no. I still wasn't gas. Because they really told me not to come back. And I wasn't too happy. But I felt good speaking. And I remember looking up and said, well, let me just go over one more the programs we did. Because we have to do it for the record. And I was like, this is doing that because they got to hit me. Because they have to go over everything. Or in my field, I didn't say they didn't take that into consideration. So I was like, go ahead. Yeah, cool. They went over it. They said, do you have anything to add? And I was like, yes. I've been here a few times already. I won't be back if I have a while. And when I got up, the commissioner who never speaks, I said, good luck. I said, it's not luck. It's responsibility. Next guy said, like, I went. I was like, no, oh, man, I fucked that up. Hey, <laughs> I'm going to get that 24 hit, I know it. He's like, why are you smiling? I was like, man, I spoke my piece. The next, next one, I'm going in there with the, the, the format. Trust me, I'm not going to do this again. But it felt good. But I still was like, damn, man, I'm too lazy. Man, I didn't call my family like I did every other program. And I remember an officer that is in the housing unit upstairs, which kind of reminds me of that. He was real understandable. And uh, he didn't go by case by case. He went by individual. He calls me, he says, go 1412. Now, 1412 building is a building that they signed you up for pre release. Now, he already had got the decisions of who the jail was getting released. So he was trying to give me the heads up. That's not a game we play. I know mean, you're cool and you And I remember walking to 1412 because I didn't get the letter yet. And I was like, man, this is not true. Man. I don't know what I'm going to do. And I went to 1412. I was like, can I hold on? Did you get the letter yet? I was like, no, I didn't. He said, hold on a second. Okay, just sign here. Like, you know what? Last time I signed something, man, I didn't care, man. It didn't look good. I'm going to wait until I get the letter, man. I'll wait the next day, and they call you down to the little library. They call everybody down. And usually, you know, you see guys get the letter, they get the little shh. Oh, man, I'm going to get the, oh, man. I grab my letter, I grab my phone once, put it in my pocket. Like, you're not going to check it? Yeah. Eat, watch a movie, 